Hello everyone and welcome back. Uh, our next project here is a pretty interesting one. It's a uh, Halicrafters model SX99 and it's a communications receiver, old vacuum tube one. And this is actually a pretty nice one. This would be probably what you would use on, you know, for ham radio back in the day. Um, it does not have a built-in speaker, so unlike the S SX40 or the S40 that we did a while back. Um, this one's a little higher end. It has the S meter on it. Um, has a few extra features on it. So uh, I thought this will be a pretty interesting video. I really enjoy working on these. I like uh, the Halicrafters equipment. Um, I own a, a S20R that uh, is completely restored and everything. And uh, they're Believe it or not, they do pretty well, even at their old age. <laughs> um, just something fun about tuning around on one of these old vacuum tube uh, communications receivers and listening to uh, some of the short wave channels that are out there and still and so forth. So if that sounds like an interesting video for you, stay tuned and uh, we're going to check this thing out. So the first thing you notice about this thing, or at least that I've noticed, is just how clean this thing is. Now the owner who brought it to me uh, said that he purchased it from an antique store and that uh, the store has a pretty good reputation for cleaning things and so forth before you know when they come in so maybe this was dirty but I'll tell you what it is it's really really clean um, it looks like it was very well taken care of I mean you can see all the way around how nice it looks so this will be a really nice example of this receiver once we get it all done um, Obviously, somebody must have been a race fan or some sort of thing. I don't know, but uh, somebody put some stickers on it. But that's not a problem. We'll, uh, you know, we can remove those or leave them or whatever. But uh, it looks really nice. Uh, I'll open this up and we'll uh, take a peek inside. And you can see down inside here just again how clean it is. A um, few of the tubes look as if they've been replaced, uh, especially this rectifier. It's one of those Radio Shack realistic lifetime tubes, which those don't always hold up for a lifetime. <laughs> but uh, these are pretty decent receivers, like I said. Um, so before I, as always, before I plug anything in, I'm going to take it apart. We're going to flip it over and look at the underneath of the chassis and make sure there's no problems there. Uh, the main filter capacitors here are rated at 475 volts. So there's some pretty substantial caps. You never really want to power anything like that up until you kind of know that there's no shorts or anything. So we're going to get this thing apart and we'll take a look under the chassis next. Looking at the underneath here, I have never seen one with this original paper tag on it and how good condition it still is so I have a feeling this was put away somewhere uh, clean and dry like in a closet in someone's house and just forgotten about for many many years there isn't even any rust on it uh, very rarely on these Halicrafters do you see um, the chassis so clean without any scratches on the paint or really any big rust there's some little tiny places but this one here is beautiful and this if if we do a full restoration on this, this thing's going to be a showpiece. It's really nice. So, uh, all right, let's keep taking it apart. Wow. Have you ever seen one like this? This is all original. Um, just about every one of these I have ever seen, any of these Halicrafters from this era, have at least had some capacitors replaced or something. But this one is absolutely bone stock original. Nothing looks to have been replaced or changed. Uh, there's a couple little cobwebs. And there was just a little bit of dust inside the bottom of the, uh, the cover, the underneath of the cover, but not much at all. And it just looks like this has never been taken apart before. I don't think it ever has. I think I'm the first one to take the screws out of this since it was uh, first assembled. So, uh, obviously, we're going to really do a meticulous job on this one, and we're going to fully restore it. Um, unfortunately, this thing is 
filled with these bumblebee capacitors and those are notorious for failing so I'm kind of glad I didn't try to plug this in or do anything like that um, I will do just a just a very very basic um, initial power up and it will be current limited and everything just to see if the radio comes on I'll have to find a speaker to connect to it because uh, these ones here do not have speakers because they were designed to be you know in a ham radio station um, hence the standby and receive switch down here and uh, so we'll put a speaker on it and uh, see if it comes up very carefully but wow <laughs> you want stock if you want to see what these looked like when they were new this is there it is that's how they were built really really nice let's do a little scan here I really like the Holocrafters radios like I said okay so the first thing we're going to do is just a simple continuity test and what we're going to do is we're going to put the meter on ohms put the probes on the prongs of the power cord and we're just going to turn the switch on here and make sure we have continuity through our transformer okay so we don't have any continuity there so let's uh, let's move on here and look at the transformer and I'm gonna connect maybe that plug is bad I was looking at that plug and it looked kinda a little bit wonky there so let's connect up here and once again nothing alright so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna just look at our transformer up here and we're just gonna look to see if the transformer has continuity between the windings the primary windings Whoop. And go from would help if I got on the right terminals and sure enough about 4.7 4.75 ohms so that's about what I would expect for a 125 volt transformer primary. So it looks like if we go between this one and here, this little wire here goes over to the little switch right over in here. Um, let's see if we can get some light on the subject right in there. And it connects between these two and we don't have any continuity so it looks like possibly this switch could be bad so maybe the switch died on this thing early on and somebody just kind of put it on a shelf and never used it I don't know of course one of the tubes was replaced yep that switch is bad so the first thing we're gonna have to do before we can do any electrical testing on this would be to uh, check out the switch but for right now let's uh, let's just jumper the switch out and then we're going to hook everything up and I am going to pull the high voltage or the uh, high voltage the rectifier tube high voltage it's all high voltage <laughs> on tubes so we'll pull this rectifier tube out and what that's going to do is by pulling your rectifier tube you're not going to allow any of the high voltage to get out to the capacitors or any of the components like that you will allow voltage to get out to the filaments which we don't worry about that but we're not going to put any big power on the uh, you know on any of these caps or anything except for this little pink one under here which is our death capacitor as people call it and uh, these will pop if they're bad but uh, so we will eventually replace that but let's jump around this switch and see if we at least get any AC out of the transformer okay now we have the uh, tube pulled out and we have our voltmeter set to AC volts and we're just looking across the output of the high voltage windings first and 
all all we're care all we're caring about right now and as you can see I jumpered out that switch um, all we care about right now is just to see if the winding is good then if these are good we're going to move over to our filament windings and check them so let's turn on the variac all right that's good the variac's turned all the way down and we got six volts AC so let's turn this up a little bit it doesn't take long for it to go up and I'm monitoring the uh, current also on my uh, variac which there's absolutely no measurable current so it's very low right now and I got uh, about 70 volts AC going in and we're getting about 400 or 378 volts out again I haven't looked at the schematics on these they're all pretty similar let's go all the way up and we got 625 volts so that's going to be a uh, 625 volts is going to be about 310 volts 0 310 volts so it'll be 310 volts between the either tap and the and the center tap so if I go from the end to this end we have about 311 volts which is good if we move over to this one and look we got a 311 there so that one's good all right so we should have filament heat now um, we can actually just kind of swing this around a little bit or we can measure right on it and uh, we should have filament our 6.3 volts and we should see the tubes glowing and yes the tubes are glowing so our filament winding is good so that's all really good news we have a good transformer I'm going to turn this down because I don't want to push the issue with this pink capacitor. And I was getting just a teeny little bit of current, which is kind of uh, showing us that those filaments are lit up and they're drawing some current. So we already know that at least we have a good transformer to work with, but we do have a bad switch. So uh, that's all good stuff. So now, now that we know that's good, we're going to take a few other measurements before we go and uh, hook up any of our high voltage or anything like that. So let me get set up for that. Okay, we have our schematics printed out here. And we have our meter connected up and a speaker connected up. And we have the Variac on. And we're going to just start bringing up the voltage here slowly until we see if we get some high voltage. So and one good thing is it's not drawing much current right now that's good so start with about 50 volts and see if that oh yeah here we go that didn't take long now did it and again the fact that the uh, rectifier tube was replaced means that this radio had to have been used somewhat um, but definitely um, not a whole lot because this thing doesn't look real hot or it doesn't look like it has any hot spots where it was you know overheated um, it was look at that it's coming right up you can see up here where the wax was broken on the adjustments uh, for the IF coils and for the different bands so somebody has done an alignment on it but they never took the cover off you know these have uh, access holes in the bottom and you align them with the cover on like that so there's no need to uh, take it apart so I don't think this was ever taken apart so let's monitor this voltage here and let's turn up some and of course I wouldn't expect to hear a whole lot because I don't have an antenna nope no sound Let's come up a little more. There's about 90 volts going in. Let's see here. Yeah, about 85 volts actually. 
And we can see the voltage is dropping a little bit as the tubes are coming to life. But I'm still not hearing anything out of the speaker. I'm not getting any hum. I am getting deflection on the meter. But nothing out of the speaker. Nothing at all. So the question is, do we have a bad speaker? I thought this was a good speaker. Let me do a little troubleshooting. Okay, the speaker is good, but we are definitely not getting any sound. And I don't know what kind of voltage we should get, so I'm going to turn this down. Um, our current was getting up a little bit, not much, so it could be that the main filter cap is starting to reform. So turn it down and we'll do a few measurements here. Okay, it helps to get your leads on the correct terminal. So according to this, we should at maximum, when we have full voltage on this, we should have about 330 volts DC coming out of the rectifier tube and going into the very first section of the cap. Uh, I'm not up all the way and I already have 295 volts, as you can see. So if we go up a little more, and there's your 330. So, our voltages are good. Um, so now, my guess is that there may be a problem with the uh, headphone jack because I believe when you plug the headphone jack in this thing, it actually will, oh yeah it does, if you look here, when we connect the headphone jack, it's going to disable the speaker. And so, I believe that's what our problem is. We may have a problem with the headphone jack. So let me check around there and then I'll be back. Okay, I am now very precariously connected straight to the speaker terminal, bypassing the headphone jack. Hopefully we're not shorting anything out. And if all is good, I should hear some volume here. And I still am not getting anything. nothing. I'm just touching the antenna terminal. Uh, so you would think that even just turning the volume knob and so forth you would get something. So I am of the impression that maybe we just don't have any sound. Let's see here. Coming out of the output section which is entirely possible. Nope, nothing. All right, so we're going to turn back down and we're going to do some other tests here. Okay, I'm now feeding directly into the uh, odd first audio tube through this capacitor, just an audio signal, and it is still completely dead. And even if I touch it, there's no, no buzz, no, there's absolutely nothing. So I'm starting to think we either have a really dead tube or we have a problem with our output transformer. So we're going to look at the output transformer next. Okay, the first thing I'm connected to is the 500 ohm tap on the output of the output transformer, the secondary of the output transformer. And as you can see, we have 61 ohms, and that's pretty reasonable for what I would expect. If we move over to this other wire, this will be the 4 ohm speaker tap. And you can see it's real low ohms, which is normal. It's a 3.2 ohm tap. And that looks pretty good there as well. So I would have to say that at least the secondary of our output transformer is good. Now let's check our primary and see what it looks like. And we have everything unplugged and discharged and so forth. And by the way, if you haven't seen one of these before, I've shown this in some of my other videos. This is my little stinger cable, 
Um, it's nothing but a resistor and a brass rod. Let me move that. And a brass rod with a lot of insulating on it, a lot of insulation. And what you can do is connect this to ground like this. And you can use it to discharge all of the capacitors. And the resistor will safely dissipate and discharge the capacitor without damaging anything. So there you go. And you can see right there, that's all we do is we go through and make sure everything's discharged. Always do that on these because um, you never know if it's going to hold a charge and you sure don't want that capacitor at three or four hundred volts discharging through you. So let's look at our secondary, or I mean, I'm sorry, our primary. Our primary is going to be this blue and red wire. So let's see, the red wire goes, looks like it's going to, coming out here, it's going to our, where's our output tube here? Should be, it's a 6K6, I'm thinking it's going to be pin 3, or pin, let's see here where it's at. From there, and our blue wire, well, let me, let me get on there because I can't see around the camera and then I'll come back. Alright, we're connected and sure enough, we have continuity on our output, so it is definitely not the, out, the audio output transformer and by connecting directly to the wires and bypassing the jack of the phone the uh, headphone jack we know that it's not a bad contact on the headphone jack so we're now down to a tube now you you may say why didn't you just check the tubes to begin with well two reasons first thing I wanted to go through the process of troubleshooting with you all second of all Tubes aren't don't go bad all that often on these. They they're pretty they, they last a pretty long time. It looks as if tubes were replaced at some point in time. So unless there was a real problem or this is a really high hours unit, I would not expect a tube to be bad, which doesn't mean that, that it could that it's not, but just less likely. But anyways, I just wanted to go through that process to show you kind of some of the, the, the ways you go through and troubleshoot some of these things. So let's check the tubes out now and see what they look like. Okay, so we're using our TV11 that we just freshly uh, restored in another video. And I have it set up for the 6K6. And let's go down and see, after we shut some glare off, let's see what this thing does. Let's turn it on. Well, tube looks okay. Now, once again, um, you know, this isn't an end-all test. But at least we know the tube, tube does have emissions, so you should get some sort of sound out of it. Um, so, at least we know that one's at least has emissions. So now let's check the, uh, oh, what's the other one here? The 6SC7 which is your uh, first AF tube. So let's check that. It's a two-section dual triode. Okay. We now have the 6SC7. If you notice, it's, it's, it's jumpy. It's very jumpy. And you can see it's not reading very good. It's got some intermittent problems here. It was really jumping around when I first turned it on. So let's go and look at the other section, which we want to go. There's our other section. And it's reading questionable as well. So this tube might be bad. We might have a bad 6SC7. So that could be part of our problem. We don't know, once again, because this is just an emissions tester. I've seen tubes test like this and work perfectly fine. I've seen other ones be like this and not work at all. Um, I actually have a 6K or 6V6 tube somewhere, 
and I just kept it for uh, an example and it dead shorts when you put it into a circuit but when you put it into this tube tester it tests good uh, no shorts and it has emissions <laughs> but as soon as you put it into a circuit it it just goes short so uh, you really can't always trust that but I have a feeling this might be a bad tube let's see if we can dig out another 6SC7 we'll test it in here for comparison and then we'll try it out okay we've cleaned the contacts and everything is good there I've checked the voltages according to this voltage chart and it is a little bit wrong um, where they're calling for on the 6k6 240 volts and 200 volts it's higher than that and the reason it's higher than that I think that's a misprint or from a different model because if you look at the dropping resistor there's um, this transformer uh, puts out eh, closer to 400 volts and then it goes through that uh, I think it's a 1.5 K resistor right down here right here this flat resistor and it is 1.5 K these are all these resistors are all intolerance and it drops the appropriate amount of voltage so this thing's actually the, the 6k6 is running on somewhere around 300 volts to 280 to 300 which I would expect they're showing it to be only two 240 or 200 but it's okay um, so what we're doing now is we're bypassing the uh, we're just going straight into the IF section and if we look on the schematic we're going down to the let me put this down we're looking at the first IF amp which is V3 and V3 pin 4 is where we're injecting 455 kilohertz uh, modulated sine wave and it's going to go in and we're going to just measure it at the output plate here going into T3, T2 IF transformer and then we're just going to trace it all the way through here and see um, if we're getting if these tubes are all working properly okay so let me zoom in see if we have a little get a little bit better view so let me see there we go so the first thing we want to do is look at and I'm using the signal tracer once again and if we look right here on pin 4 this is where we're injecting the signal and when we touch on here you can hear all kind of noise very 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 small signal going in there okay so this is touching it you can't even hear it I mean literally I can't hear it unless I turn the volume all the way up on the signal tracer if we go to the output <laughs> blowing my speaker out so and you can hear all the noise and everything with it and there it is over there on the transformer the output of the transformer winding is right here, the secondary. And you can hear right there, we have a signal there. If we go to the next tube, the other end of that wire goes here. And you can hear it. And if we go to the output of that, which I think is this pin, much 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 louder so this one's amp so our second IF is amplifying properly if we go down through the transformer into our and this is called the uh, this thing so sensitive it even <laughs> um, if you go into our detector tube which is our 6H6 and we want to go on to pin 5 there let me put you up on that Let's see here we on it yeah pin 5 which is let's see if I can see around here <laughs> yep I would say that's working <laughs> and if we go to pin 4 
of our first audio amp, which is the 6SC7, which is down here. Um, I'm looking around the camera or here, guys, so bear with me. Uh, let me see. Hold on till I see it, because I can't see around the camera. Okay, that's going to be this pin right here. And you can hear the signal going in and then coming out, which is pin 5. Let me see here, make sure I'm right. Yeah, pin 4 is the input, pin 5 is the plate, or is the uh, anode, which is right here. And you can hear, here's the input, here's the output. I don't even know if your, the microphone's picking it up. So this tube is not amplifying at all. So uh, now what we're probably looking at is something going on here with uh, one of the resistors or capacitors. Now, let's just stop right here. So the fir first part of this video, we've really done a whole bunch of troubleshooting. And the main reason I did this was to show you all some techniques, how to trace the signal through the amp or through the receiver, um, how to check the power supplies, how to check your power transformer. These are all good practices to do. Um, now, <laughs> all the capacitor cowboys out there are going to be like, you should have just recapped the whole thing. Well, true. You know, if you're, if you're restoring this, you're going to replace the capacitors, especially when you see these bumblebee capacitors. A lot of them, you know, are notorious for shorting and leaking and so forth. But really the point of this exercise wasn't to just show you, anybody can clip out capacitors and put new ones in, but really what we wanted to go over was a little bit of how you go about tracing the signal through the radio and finding out where the problem is. You know, a lot of times we can replace a whole bunch of components and actually put problems into the circuit rather than take the problems out um, by you know, putting something on the wrong pin or by moving some wires and causing noise or interference or oscillations. Um, once you do that, it's really hard to uh, figure out whether you caused the problem or whether you're, that's the original problem you were troubleshooting. So it's nice to know how to go through these and troubleshoot them. Um, now, a lot of times you get, you see so many of these, you just jump right to a, you know a certain point and find it right away but I didn't want to do that on this I wanted to actually kind of demonstrate troubleshooting process through this so really to recap what we did is we checked our power supply here and we applied a voltage to it and just pulled the rectifier tube out and if you remember we just checked and made sure all of our AC voltages were there and then we brought this back up, plugged the tube in, and then we just brought everything up slowly on a variac, and we monitored our DC voltages and made sure that they were okay, made sure there was no hum or anything like that. Um, the other thing we wanted to make sure was that there was no excessive current being drawn, because obviously if there's excessive current, you have a capacitor or a component that's shorted or leaking or something, and that could damage your rectifier tube, that could damage your transformer, all kinds of things. So we wanted to monitor that very carefully. Once we were sure we didn't have any major leaks or major problems, then we went and tried to actually get sound out of the radio. When we were unable to get any sound, then we took our signal generator and we injected a signal at the beginning and just tried to follow it through here. Now, I always split radios like this up into two sections. You have your the before the converter and after the converter. Um, if your local oscillator or your RF amplifier or one of your coils or a capacitor or something in here is not working, um, all of the rest of it afterwards still should work. So right before you see your first IF or intermediate frequency amplifier, first IF, you can always take your 
signal generator, set it to the IF frequency, which in this radio is going to be 455 kilohertz, and inject it through a capacitor, just like we did here. So this capacitor isolates your signal generator from any voltages that might be there. Number one, you're protecting your test equipment, and number two, you're protecting the input of the device from your, your test equipment as well. So you're isolating them through this capacitor. So once we couple that in there, we're going to put the signal here and then somehow on our plate or our, our anode, we're going to try to measure the output. Now there's multiple ways to do it. Um, in the past you've seen me use things like oscilloscopes and things like that to check it. Um, you know, through a capacitor or whatever. But in this instance, we're using our little signal tracer. And a signal tracer, once again, is a very simple device. It's a high gain amplifier. And the probe consists of a one of these isolation capacitors. Now, there may be some other things in there, some resistors or whatever. But the most important thing is that you have a capacitor isolating the tip of this probe from the input of your high gain amplifier in here. So that's really all your probe is. Now, if you're looking, uh, the other thing that this is going to have in it is it's going to have one of those diodes, one of those uh, germanium diodes, and it's going to act as a detector diode. And, it, you know, again, check my video out on, on uh, detection, how you use the diode to strip the audio signal off of the RF signal. So really that's what's in here a capacitor and a diode not much else and we're going to use this to check the output now remember these these are amplifier tubes so you know even if we're not using something like an oscilloscope or something like that and remember if you're using your scope make sure you isolate it with a capacitor because if you put a high DC on your scope you, you will fry your scope so know know what you're doing before you do this uh, that's why I like these little signal tracers because they're designed for this job. So if if you noticed that 455 I was putting in there was only you know a couple of millivolts, which is a pretty strong signal still, but it's very very low um, com in comparison to what's coming out. If you notice when I touched it here, it was very very quiet, and then when we touched our probe here on pin five, it was much louder. Then we followed it through this transformer and we checked on the secondary of the transformer where it goes into our second IF amp, which is this 6XK7. And we checked it here and we heard our signal. It was a little bit quieter than here because it passed through this transformer and got shaped, you know, to, to block out all the other frequencies. So it's kind of a filter. And then when we measured the the anode of 6SK7, again, the signal was greatly amplified. We then traced it through here down to our detector tube, and it was very loud here. And we traced it back up into the input of the first audio amp. So now there's no RF going in here now. It's strictly just audio frequency. And when we, when we checked here, we had our signal still. However, when we checked here, it was very, very weak. And there's no, uh, we don't see, um, you know, there's no amplification at all. It was very weak. So when we look in here, we changed the tube out. It didn't make any difference. So now we have to look at, is something in here snubbing out our circuit. So do we have a, a leaky capacitor? Do we have a shorted resistor? Uh, what's going on? So that's our next thing that we're going to do. We're going to kind of try to figure that out. And then once we do that, hopefully we should get to our next stage, which is the output tube, and uh, see if it's amplifying. Because I have a feeling there's something wrong with this as well. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Okay, so we checked our voltage here on the anode of this tube, and lo and behold, there was no voltage at all on there. Actually, it was nothing. Um, if you look up here, what's going on, you have your main 
300 volt supply here, or whatever it is, 300 and some volts, comes through this little half watt resistor, which is a 270K resistor, and then goes to the anode of this. Now that 270K, if you measure from this to ground, there should be about 75 volts on the anode of uh, this 6, 6SC7. There was no voltage. So what I did then is we shut it down, used the bleeder stick, stinger cable, and bled down our capacitors. And if you measure across this 270 ohm or 270k resistor, we look at it. She's wide open. So we have a bad resistor. And that's why we're not getting any gain out of that uh, tube there. So we're going to replace this resistor and uh, just temp temporarily clip one in there. And we're going to see what we get. All right, so we now have a, another resistor just clipped right across there. You see I have a couple of crocodile clips. And uh, there's the resistor. And when we turn it on, and you can hear we now have we now have a signal. So of course everything's distorted and gross because we have these old capacitors and everything. But that was the main problem with the radio. So uh, now we know that uh, that that was the main thing causing this thing not to work. Now I still from all the distortion we're hearing and things like that I'm still kind of thinking that we may have some other issues but uh, the main problem was that resistor and we troubleshot it and now we know so we'll get that replaced and now it's okay to start going through now that now that we at least have the radio working somewhat to go through and do our recapping or whatever we're gonna do All right, we got this little 270 picofarad uh, mica cap out of the circuit, and we just have it connected up to the tester. And let's see if we can get you at an angle where you can see this without taking the camera off the mount. If we hit this, you can see right on, I don't know, you can't. <laughs> 269 picofarads. <clears throat> Hold on. There, how's that? 269 picofarads right on the money so this cap is perfect and leakage wise absolutely zero leakage so we're going to leave that one alone <clears throat> I just thought I'd show that to you um, I actually had an original new old stock carbon resistor with the long leads uh, 270k so we're going to put that one in so it'll be all nice and original and uh, we're going to replace this 022 uh, bumble bomb down here with a uh, regular film cap a little mylar or uh, one of these little right here <clears throat> so there you go okay so I want you uh, to take a look at this and <laughs> tell you to save your old tube sockets because you never know when a disaster like this is going to happen. Um, this is the pin, sorry, but I'm bumping the camera. This is the pin that came out of where that resistor was. It was just hanging on by a thread. As you can see, when this was soldered at the factory, they just put great big globs of solder all over the place. This is all the way it was from the factory and this was no exception so normally you know you, you might think you have to drill out and put a new socket in there but really not if you have an old socket these pins are actually removable so if you take a look here I have this pin that I have removed from an old socket now it's a little bit dirty and we're gonna clean it up but after we do that it's very simple to replace. Um, all you need to do is take a small pair of pliers or a small screwdriver, something like this, 
and you just take you bend these up and there's just one little kind of retainer tab that they have on them and you can push this straight through just like that and then we take let me see here take your hobby knife and you can just kind of use it to push this on out and let's see on the other side here we should be able to get it out there it is right there and I'm not going to be able to do this around the camera but it can actually be pushed right out through the end here and you can kind of see it's already pushed forward but I'll have to do this off camera well maybe not and let's see almost it's hard to do around this camera but you can basically there it is right there And it pops right out. And here's your old one. It's like pulling a tooth. And here's our new one. So we'll clean this off and we'll get it pushed back in there. And if you look, there's a tiny little tab here. And this tab just kind of bends out and that locks the pin from being pulled back out. So, and what happens is right here where this where the socket you know where the tab meets this socket here you can see how thin that is and these will just over time they'll wear loose and then they'll snap off so save your old tube sockets because you can actually clean these pins off remove them and replace them without having to put a whole new socket in your tube so just a little tip I've done it myself at my own doctor, so I'm going to go to DMXI and Bourbon. It's substantially less money because I pay that deductible. I just explain it right off the bat. And that's why, as a patient, you have to be more um, informed, more aggressive. It is your money, after all, to try to keep more. Well, here we go. All right, so you can see we got the... Uh, amplifier rebuilt down there replaced the caps and it's all fixed working good so here's what I replaced so far and all of the caps that are in there uh, with the exception of this one I didn't test it yet this was the across the line cap which I replaced with an XY these were really leaky all of them really badly leaky this resistor was a little bit out of tolerance. It was a 10K. It was reading 12K. Other than that, all the other resistors in there were reading just perfectly dead on. So those were really good. The resistors are in good condition. So uh, we're going to continue to go through and uh, rebuild the rest of this. And uh, now the rest of this should just be recapping and then get into the alignment. Okay, we have everything all recapped. And uh, here's all the old components and I checked them as I went along and over half of them were leaky um, probably three quarters of them or more were actually out of tolerance they were you know the reading high capacitance even if they weren't really leaky and uh, so as you can imagine replacing the caps on this made an enormous difference on the performance I haven't even I've not done anything to this yet. I haven't touched the alignment. I haven't changed the tubes. I have not done anything but the recap and the little repairs that we did in the last clip. And you can hear how much better the sound is. have recently reached the goal of retirement and, and we'll be able to kind of fold that conversation into this as well. For those nearing retirement... And then if we turn on the AVC... Should they be worried about that 2020 timeline? Uh, probably not. Right. The Social Security Administration says that the interest income alone... It sounds really good. Um, has a nice tone to it, just like every Halicrafter's. You know, of all the restorations that I do, these Halicrafter radios like this are my favorite. 
it's something therapeutic about restoring them and recapping them, working on them. Um, I really enjoy the way they function after I'm done working on them. So this is really not work to me. This is actually enjoyment. It's therapeutic. I really like it. But uh, so far, this one's going really well. One thing I did find out, or I'm starting to suspect, is if we look closely at the main filter capacitor. Um, you can see how the solder is kind of splattered down here. Looking on the other side, this electrolytic can capacitor was replaced. So there were two things done to this uh, receiver in its life, and that's it. So they must have taken the cover off at some time, but only the one time. Um, they replaced the can capacitor, and like I said, it was aligned by someone in its lifetime. Other than that, this thing looks really low hours, low usage. Uh, only maybe two resistors were out of tolerance, needed replaced. We had that one open one, and we had the one 10K that was reading 12K. Every other resistor in this entire receiver was either completely dead on or very, very close. Um, none of them have any scorch or burn marks on them. There's no tarnish on anything. So again, this, this thing is in really good condition. Other than the bumblebee capacitors, <laughs> as expected, were all bad or mostly bad. So just recapping it did an enormous uh, improvement. Now there is one big nasty cap up in here on the band select switch or the, vo what is it, the sorry, on the AVC switch and gain switch, and you can see it right in here. And that one, we're going to take the faceplate off when we go to clean this thing up, and we'll replace that one then. So that's the only original capacitor that's left now. All the other ones have been redone, and uh, it's working great. So let's get the uh, faceplate off, do some cleaning on this, and uh, and then we'll proceed with the uh, putting it together and doing the alignment. Well, we have the radio all put back together now. Um, I cleaned off the face plate. I cleaned the glass, uh, soaked the knobs in hot water with dishwashing detergent, and that seems to always work the best on any knobs, whether they're plastic or aluminum. Uh, it won't tarnish the aluminum. It breaks up the dirt, makes it easier to clean. And then I just take an old toothbrush, kind of like this, and just kind of brush the dirt out from the, the knurled parts, and it comes right out, and they clean up really well. Uh, these stickers are really on here. I'm not going to try to remove them, because uh, it'll just scratch the paint. So I'm just going to leave well enough alone. Uh, the radio works very well, but it is not very sensitive. And I think part of that is because it was... There, there was an alignment attempt, attempted on it at some point in time, uh, so it could be a little bit out of alignment. The other thing is when you recap things, even if it was properly aligned, some of those capacitors may somewhat affect uh, the sensitivity of the radio or so forth. So we're going to go through and do an alignment, and my feeling about it is that probably once we do, we're going to see that this thing's going to wake right up. Um, if it's anything like the S20R that I have, which is actually a lower end model than this one and an older model than this one. Uh, I have a feeling that this radio is going to work really well. The difference between this and the S20, uh, the S20 is kind of more of a consumer grade radio uh, meant for listening to shortwave. It can do the ham bands and everything. But really when you look at this radio, it, it was very much designed from the ground up to be a, uh, you know, for amateur radio users. If you look very closely, and I'll zoom in, you can see they even mark down here uh, the meter bands for the band spread. So you have your 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meter band ham bands. And those uh, are to be used with this band spread knob. And you take the main tuning dial and if you look around on the main tuning dial, you'll see little, little square, little rectangular areas that are highlighted. For instance, right here, and right here's one, right here's one. And if you go to the end of those, and you see the dot right here, and go to these different spots, 
they represent the beginning of that band for your band spread knob. So you can put you can put this on one of the the beginning of one of the uh, marks here, and then use the band spread to actually get an accurate tuning. And that's how this thing works. Um, so you would go through, and we'll go over this once we get it uh, aligned and everything. But you can actually by using the band spread, using our phasing control with the with the uh, with the crystal uh, oscillator there, and then using the antenna trimmer to trim up the antenna at that particular band, uh, you can really get a very very good selectivity on this radio. So and very good sensitivity. So anyhow, let's go do our alignment and see how this turns out, and then we'll give it a good test. To do the alignment, like I said, you're going to want to put the cover back on the radio because the cover actually will affect your alignment. And that's the other reason this might not be uh, as accurate right now or as sensitive, because we have the cover off. So we may put the cover on and find out that it's performing a little bit better. Uh, another note here, since this video is already too long, I did have to replace the power switch on the back of the uh, on on the back of the tone control. So you have this tone control, and when it's all the way off, it turns the power off to the radio. And <laughs> what I basically did again earlier, I said don't throw away all your old tube sockets because you can harvest the pins out of them to rebuild broken pins on tube sockets and not have to replace the whole socket. Same thing goes with your old potentiometers. Um, these old pots actually have the switches built right into them. And you can see here's a switch that was removed from the back of one of these. And you see this is how it works. You can see it click back and forth. And uh, you can remove these out of an old pot and then put it into the new one, which is what I basically did over here so that uh, that fixed it. You can sometimes find some new old stocks online and so forth, but they're very expensive, hard to come by, and it's hard to find one that's the correct size. So if you save all your old potentiometers and the old switches and things, you can dig through your junk box and usually you can find what you need. So that's another tip. Again, if you haven't noticed, this video is more about all the tips for working on these than it is about the radio itself. Okay, so let's get the cover on and let's start checking our alignment. Okay, so after telling you all that you have to put the covers on before you do this, I kind of jumped the gun on that. You do have to put the covers on when you do the uh, RF alignments, but for the IF alignments you actually need to be in here uh, to adjust it with the covers off. So you do that first, and uh, my bad for jumping the gun on that with you guys, but here's what we have. This is kind of a unique way of aligning the uh, 455 intermediate frequency. A lot of uh, radios, uh, you put a 455 kilohertz um, modulated signal into the antenna jack, and then you would align your, uh, or into the first IF stage, whatever, however they tell you to inject the signal, and then you align your IF transformers. Well, this is actually a ham radio, and it's designed to pick up CW, which is Morse code or continuous wave, um, and they utilize that to their advantage. So what we're going to do is we're going to inject a 455 kilohertz unmodulated, so it's just a 455 kilohertz sine wave that we're going to inject right into the tuning gang. And if you look at this connection here, this goes to the tuning gang. So there's a wire that goes through a little hole up here and if I show you you can see there's a wire that goes comes right up through here and it attaches to the wafer switch right here right where this hook clip is connected. And I have the hook clip going to a 0.2 micro 0 0.02 microfarad capacitor as the instructions say and then it comes out of my signal generator and I just have a basic uh, 455 unmodulated kilohertz <laughs> sine wave going in. So what they're going to have us do is they have you connect the speaker up and you adjust the BFO which I'll show you where that is right on the front here 
you can see we have the pitch control and they want you to remove the knob it would help if I move down here's your pitch control uh, remove the knob and we're going to set our band selector to band selector 2 now one of the another unique thing about this radio is the local oscillator it says the frequency local oscillator frequency is higher so it's 455 kilohertz higher than the signal frequency on bands 1 2 and 3 yet it is lower than the signal frequency on band 4 so what that means is your local oscillator frequency will always be 455 kilohertz higher than your fundamental tuning frequency on bands 1 2 and 3 but on band 4 which is the highest frequencies that goes up to 30 megahertz there it's actually going to be 455 kilohertz lower than your fundamental tuning frequency so uh, kind of interesting how they do this and obviously remove the chassis from the cabinet for IF alignment and uh, RF alignment can be made with the chassis in the cabinet holes in the bottom provide access and we'll look at that later so the first thing they want us to do is uh, <laughs> let me hook up the speaker for a second and let you hear what this sounds like and you'll know why I'm doing things a little bit differently so I now have the speakers connected and uh, I have everything set up the way they want and we're set on reception for CW so what that means is that if we're off of our fundamental off of, off of our IF frequency the difference between the IF frequency of 455 kilohertz and the tuned frequency that our IF is set at will create what's called a beat frequency and the beat frequency is going to be a tone that's a so if you have 455 kilohertz IF signal out of your signal generator but the oscillator in the IF is running at maybe 454 kilohertz you'll hear a one kilohertz tone through the speaker and that's called a beat frequency and the idea is they want us to use the pitch control which is the basically a little beat frequency oscillator of its own and we're going to zero beat on to 455 kilohertz so that we know we're exactly set at 455 kilohertz with the uh, the BFO so we're basically going to take that out of the picture then we're going to use it as that to align our IF so if you listen when I turn the volume up you'll hear that beat frequency because this thing is not set yet we didn't set the BFO pot you hear how bad that is that's horrible to be able to, to listen to that <laughs> would drive me batty I don't know about you but I couldn't take it so what I'm what I did was I've connected my oscilloscope as you can see to the speaker terminals and I'm just going to take this little 4 ohm resistor because it's a 4 ohm speaker terminal here and I'm just going to put a 4 ohm dummy load on there and then I'm going to observe that beat frequency on my scope so let me get hooked up and I'll show you okay we're now we're now connected to the dummy load and I'm going to turn the volume up and you can see it on the scope but you can't hear it in the speaker because now we're working through a uh, resistive dummy load and what we're going to do is we're going to move over to here and we're going to adjust right here which is this coil this is your BFO uh, pitch control we're going to set it until we zero beat it now what zero beat means is that the BFO frequency equals our 455 kilohertz signal generator frequency so when I rotate this you're going to see you're looking right now at that high frequency thing and it, there's about two kilohertz on there right now that's why it sounded so annoying and shrieky because there's a two kilohertz beat frequency as we adjust this that frequency will go down to zero Hertz so let's see if we can do it and you can see how it's getting wider and wider and as it's getting wider it's going to go down in amplitude until finally and see now I went through it and it starts coming back so there's a null point and there you go so we've just zero beat that frequency so step one is done now step two we're going to same thing we're gonna have the same 
same signal going into the same place and the only difference is now we are going to use our uh, our setting right now and we're going to adjust the first IF coil and it says it wants somewhere between 400 and 1 kilohertz 400 hertz and 1 kilohertz note um, and that's it so that's what they want so let's get set up for that okay I've now adjusted the BFO pitch knob to get a nice little sine wave out and you can see it's about 500 it's between 400 and a kilohertz um, 550 Hertz here doesn't really matter and now what we're going to do is we're going to adjust that slug to peak that out so so we're going to adjust our first IF and uh, okay that's the wrong way Wow and you can see right there that's it peaked out right there okay so that's done and now we're going to go to our next step all right so after we set that and we zero beat it we put the knob back on the BFO pitch control and we set it to center so we set that knob so that centered spot theoretically should be your uh, your zero pitch um, for your pitch control and that's what they're having you do so now that all of that's done we go back to normal we go back to AM instead of CW and we're going to complete the 455 kilohertz alignment and now it's more traditional we're going to put a 455 kilohertz IF and we're going to modulate it with an AM frequency of 400 Hertz and that's what you're seeing right now and we're looking at where the speaker terminals are and we're going to adjust all of the rest of our IF slugs for peak so so we're on the other side of that first slug that we adjusted and you can see it was it was right on so that that side was good then we're going to move to our second IF um, which is going to be this one back here let me get on it and we're going to turn that that one was peaked right on do you see that okay then we go to the other side of that one So that one's nice that's good then we go to our last one okay and uh, sure enough all those ones were like right on as you can see so our IF alignment is complete and the uh, the next step is going to be to actually adjust our RF section and to do the RF section again we're gonna have to put the covers on so let me get that all put together and we'll move on from there okay we have the receiver back in its case and we're in the final home stretch here of the alignment and uh, as I said when we do the RF section of this we actually have to do it with the covers on and that's what all these access holes are for now there's four bands and there's a high scale and low scale for each band that you adjust and there's a uh, mi a mixer and oscillator adjustment for each one so basically for each band there are four adjustments so there's oscillator and mixer for upper scale oscillator and mixer of lower scale and then there's four scales so right now we're on the uh, on band three and right now we're doing the lower scale which is 5.1 megacycles or megahertz so if you look over at the signal generator we're set at 5.1 megahertz I'm at negative 70 dBm I'm going into the funny little circuit that they want the matching and dummy matching antenna circuit 
and it's on the it shows you on the instructions how to make it it's just a, capa a couple capacitors and a, and a inductor and a resistor and we're going to adjust this coil till we bring in our signal so right now we have 5.1 megahertz and we have the the tuning dial on the radio set to 5.1 megahertz and when we hit that I'm gonna go right in here and adjust it and when we hit it you're gonna see the frequency or the uh, the audio popping up on this on the scope here so let's see if I can work around the camera which is not the easiest thing on earth and we will try to align this okay here we go you can see there it is and then we go to our other coil here and as you can see that's about pretty good right there and you're seeing just kind of the thing going out of sync and everything because I've got such a low signal going in there it's just kind of jumping around a little bit from noise but that's it if you turn it up here right there so that's it and really let me turn this back down and really that's all there is to it um, you basically set it to the frequency they tell you set the frequency generator to the frequency they tell you and adjust either the capacitor or the slug uh, the coil slug um, until you get the peak signal that you can get and that's it. Once we're done with that, we're ready for a test to see how sensitive this thing is. So let me finish the last couple little settings and we'll go from there. Okay, so we have this thing all connected and ready to go. I have an antenna connected to it. And I'm going to make this really quick, guys, because uh, there is actually a uh, nasty thunderstorm on its way. And I don't want to be on my 43-foot vertical antenna with this while it's <laughs> if it starts the lightning. So... Let's uh, get this set up and uh, we'll do a quick test. So first of all, we're on the AM broadcast band. Let's talk forward. And a couple of things you need to know. First of all, when you start tuning this, you want to get this thing in like a static -y area or in a weak station like this. And then we adjust our antenna trimmer for maximum static. And you can hear right there, right about there. So that's set. Now, if you notice, the meter is not doing anything right now. And the reason is the meter won't really do anything unless you have the AVC on. And it even says that in the instructions. Um, basically the the meter is designed to show you the carrier level with the AVC on so if you see we click that on the meter comes in and you hear all that staticky popping that's the storm that's off in the distance. It's probably about uh, 15, 20 miles away, but it's on its way in. So <laughs> we're going to do a quick sweep, and then uh, we're going to call this one quits. From him, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. A family from South Africa, myself. I'd buy them a farm. I'd like so do you notice how much this radio has woken up since we got everything aligned now? Um, it wasn't very sensitive. Now it's very sensitive. Again, I'm in a bad area here, but it's picking up a lot of stations, and it's in the middle of the afternoon. So this thing's doing really well. Now let's go over to uh, a different band. Uh, let's see here. Not sure. Maybe uh, see if 20 meters is doing anything. I doubt it, you know, you know, not with the weather the way it is. I don't know what we're going to get, but uh, we can try it. So we'll see here. Go 
paper here. Let's see where we at. Uh, there we go. Let's get around here. And again, we could use the band spread if we want. Not much but static right now. There's one. There's a short wave station. So again, they put out an article saying there's no evidence of Hillary colluding with the New York Times. WikiLeaks emails prove otherwise. But again, they've already declared it to be fake news. So it goes down the memory hole. Here's another example of how Snopes is a far left partisan biased website from the Daily Call headline. And this is from 2017. Snopes caught playing defense for Democrats who sat during Navy SEAL tribute. Now, of course, we can't do a lot with uh, CW or anything at this time of day, um, you know, with the conditions the way they are. If we were, we would switch this down to CW, and then we can use our pitch control to get, uh, to change the tone of the, of the uh, CW tone. Um, and over here, you can switch in to your crystal, uh, crystal selectivity adjustment and it'll use the crystal oscillator in there the crystal filter and you can have broad or sharp filtering and uh, it'll make it a lot tighter and then you can adjust the phasing with this but once again those are really only good for listening to for instance listening to the ham bands and so forth and you hear how it fades in and out and that's pretty normal here with this kind of stuff Let's go. Okay, here's some lower, lower short wave. So anyways, you get the point. Um, yeah, this thing seems to be working really well. I do know with my uh, signal generator, I'm getting really good uh, sensitivity with it. And uh, the meter's working well, of course. The other thing is when you use the sensitivity knob on this, um, I was calling that, so this is the selectivity, I'm sorry. This is your filtering. Um, if, if you turn the AVC off, it is really easy to swamp the front end of this. This thing has so much gain in the little RF stage at the front end that it actually will swamp out pretty easily. And you really do have, you see what the meter is doing? I actually have to move it for the meter to start kicking in because it actually swamps out so bad that you lose your signal. So... And so... You really have to have the AVC turned on for the meter to work properly. And up in this section, there's not going to be anything, really. So go back down around 1.6 mega. And you can see how much more power you get when you when you're using the. 
your garage ready for your new Honda with amazing deals. And if we turn on the AVC. So you get the point. Um, this radio turned out really well. I mean, the knobs cleaned up really nice. Um, the case was pretty nice to begin with. Uh, the rebuild went well. The alignment went well. So I think the owner of this is going to really enjoy it. He's been looking for a radio like this for a long time, and I think this one's going to serve him well. This one's going to get a lot of use. This this radio will be turned on and listened to. It's not going to be a shelf queen, which is a good thing. The beautiful radio like this, it should be used and enjoyed as long as uh, shortwave and AM broadcast is still around. Enjoy it, you know. So uh, that ends this video, and I have so many other things to do. And this one took me a really long time to do just because of the lack of time I've had to spend on the bench. As you notice, the comments on this video were a little bit lacking. Um, you know, there was big gaps of time between when I worked on it, and so I'm sure this video isn't the clearest uh, flowing video I've done, but hope you forgive me for that. And uh, once again, I thank you all. Uh, thank you all for your contributions you've made to the channel. Thank you for the wonderful comments. Um, hopefully, there'll be plenty of more interesting videos to come here soon. And uh, as always, peace, joy, happiness, and good health in all your lives. And take care all and stay well. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.